Welcome to the AR Performance Squash Advantage, hosted by me, Ahad Raza, a former PSA Touring Pro turned elite performance mentor and coach. I break down tactics, technique, fitness, and mindset by analyzing players from the past and present, both men and women. I aspire to teach, empower, and guide transformation. Let's get started. What's up, everyone? Today's match is rowdy, to say the least. I don't know if any of you are subscribed to PSA Squash TV and you've had a chance to watch the full match, but PSA Squash TV put the highlights up on their YouTube channel, and that's what I'm sharing over here. And similar to what I've been doing throughout this Elguna tournament, I'm going to walk you through a tactical breakdown of the game. So we're going to check out the, in my opinion, highly controversial match between Mustafa Sal and Mohamed Abulgar, which took place yesterday. If you haven't watched it, check out the highlights. I'll walk you through some elements of it. I watched the match yesterday, so I have a little bit more context behind what was going on through most of the rallies, but I'm going to do my best to walk you guys through some of the foundations similar to what we've talked about in the past. It's critical because you're going to see that the players aren't doing extremely novel, unique things all the time. The game is based on the same fundamental principles. It's just a matter of who can execute them more consistently, who's a little bit more accurate with their shot making. And then this is obviously assuming that you have a baseline level of fitness to allow you to do everything you need to do on the court. So get ready. We're going to check out the video in a moment. But before we get there, let's walk you through a little summary of some coaching points. So check it out, guys. I have a bunch of coaching points that you see on your screen. Let's go through it quickly and then you can see how these things actually unfold in the match itself. So number one, length sets up everything. If your length is good, meaning it's serving its purpose, and its purpose could be different things in different situations. Sometimes the purpose of your length might be to just move your opponent off the tee, and you might overhit your length so it comes off the back wall, which prevents your opponent from actually being forced in their mind to cut it off before the back glass. So they'll follow it back and then they'll take it off the back glass. That could be an effective length if that's your goal. And effective length could also be one that fades second bounce into the back nick. That would be an attacking length. That's where you're trying to win the point. So there are many ways of hitting effective length. It could be high and soft. It could be low and hard. It could be is straight or cross so there is a lot of variety that goes into effective length the key thing is with effective length that it serves the purpose that you have set out to serve if your length is being volleyed and cut off and putting you under pressure it is ineffective regardless of anything else you're also going to see and i've mentioned this we're going to keep repeating this and i'm i'm going to keep repeating it hoping that it just sinks in to your brain and you never forget it this idea of patterns and breaking patterns. And now I've talked about patterns and breaking patterns from a shot selection standpoint, meaning you could hit from the same position, you could hit a straight drive, a cross score drive, a straight drop, a boast, you know, right there you have four shot options from the same position. That's one way of breaking patterns. If you play only a straight drive from the back left, straight drive from the back left, straight drive from the back left, boast from the back left, your opponent's probably shifting to the back left, you've hit the boast in the opposite corner of the court, you're probably gonna win the point depending on your level or you're definitely gonna put them under a lot of pressure. Now on the other hand, you can also think about patterns as the pace of play or the height. So some people might play a ton of slow lobs, that's their pattern. Your opponent gets used to that speed of movement and that rhythm of the game. All of a sudden, if you play a low hard ball, well, it suddenly changes up the pattern and you kind of jerk your opponent around and it's something that they're not used to. So this idea is, and this goes back into like deeper things we can talk about for a long time, but if you think about adaptation or you think about this idea of forming an equilibrium, human beings like to form equilibriums. We like to be comfortable, but you need to push your opponent into uncomfortable positions. How can you do that? By almost lulling them into something and then changing it on them, then lull them in and then change it on them. So you're always forcing them to adapt to different situations. Now, you're gonna notice that players, generally speaking, especially at the high level, do not force the situation. They do not try to attack when they're already under a tremendous amount of pressure. If they do, it's rare, 
and it's only by the most skilled players. Like there, there are going to be times where you see Gawad go in to the front right corner when he's under full stretch, barely reaching the ball, and he'll hit a little trickle boast. Well, he can do that because he has the skill, the strength, the experience, the execution percentage, all of that stuff to actually make that work. And he will win the point because no one's expecting that. But for the vast majority of players, if you try to do too much when you're under a lot of pressure, you're probably just going to either put yourself under more pressure or you're going to lose the point up front. And you'll even see players that are 30, 40, 50, 60, and obviously weaker players in the world making this mistake a lot. You know, they'll have opponents under pressure and then their opponent hits a good ball, but they still try to force it. The ball's too tight, they try to force it, they hit the tin. They are not respecting and resetting the play. So the idea here is apply pressure, apply pressure, hit the good length, hunt the volley, hit the good length, hunt the volley. But if your opponent hits a good defensive ball to relieve that pressure, well, you have to respect and reset, meaning go back to playing the basics, set it up with a good length again, and then attack the ball. Now, obviously, you don't have to hit a good length if your opponent's fluffed up a loose ball. Don't hit length to them. Attack that loose ball that you get. But the idea is to use your length to create that loose ball and create that opportunity and then attack it. The higher the level, the more the game takes place with that length hitting because players are able to hit so consistently that it's hard to create that loose ball and be in a good position to attack it right away. And then the last thing I'm going to mention here is around sportsmanship and fair play. And in this case, effective movement. So I don't know if any of you have watched the full match, but if you have, Mustafa Sal does a lot of interesting, interesting things with his movement. He'll hit the ball and he'll move back, so it's right into the line of Abulgar. Or he'll hit the ball and then move directly across into the line of Abulgar, and his legs are sticking out, and Abulgar's tripping on him, and all sorts of stuff is happening. I've never been a fan personally of taking up too much space. I like free-flowing clean squash effective movement let your opponent go get that ball you hit a good ball let them go get it i dislike playing against players who block a lot and and use these different antics so i'm putting it out there if you have watched it you'll have an idea of what i'm talking about if you haven't watched it well if you get a chance to watch extended highlights in some way or if you have a subscription to squash tv check it out because you'll see these little nuances in movement that some of these top players do and in my opinion it, it breaks the game up it makes it too choppy it takes away from the fun and the free-flowing nature of squash okay with that let's get into the video and and i will say you know a lot of players have this mindset of doing anything to win within legal rules of the game and technically taking your space is a legal element of the game. Referees are becoming far more particular about the style of movement and you'll notice even in this match Asal did get strokes awarded against him because of his shady clearance but it needs to be enforced even more so that it never gets to that point where there's so much contact and people are tripping and falling and all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to leave it there before I go on a rant and let's get into these, the, the video and I'll pause it here and there like I did in the previous video also from Elguna. So the video is going to start in a couple of seconds and here we go. This is early in the first game you see Abulgar. There you go. So there's that one-two punch combo that we talked about and I'll link to the Amar Shabana video where I talked about that. Let me rewind this just a little bit so you can see Abulgar put this one-two punch in. And see, you can set up a one-two punch with anything. You're going to see here, Abulgar is in this position. He hits this attacking cross-court kill. Asal stutters a little bit because it's a shot he hasn't seen yet. And this ball is fading into the side wall. Generally speaking, when you want to hit a kill, you want to try to hit the second bounce before the short line over here. Because players, the kill looks like a drive, so players will be moving back. And then if that ball is fading short, they're going to have to struggle to move forward again. You have to change your momentum really fast. So Asal gets it. So Abulgar's kill came a little bit deeper. If it was a little bit shorter, he would have probably won the point outright. Asal barely gets the ball. He hits a loose return that's coming on Abulgar's racket. So this kill was punch number one. And there's the awesome volley drop right in the middle of the court. Executed to perfection. 
second punch combo right there. And it all started with the kill because he broke the pattern, and that's just the finish. So now they're jockeying for position. You see them, they're, they're changing the direction of play. So you see Abulgar is going cross quite a bit, some straight, some cross, and it's throwing Asal's movement off. And that's just a wicked, wicked Nick winner. So if you come back here, what set that up? It was, this is another one-two punch combo. So Asal plays the ball short. He caught the sidewall, it was a little bit lucky, so it popped out, forcing a weak return from Abulgar. And Asal's ready over here. He can he has so many options from this position and he loves that nick. And he really accelerates his racket head through this ball. That's that's another way to really flatline it the way he did. And there's that just crushes that nick. No chance. But again, one two punch. Put that drop in right there, forces a loose ball, follows it up with the winner. Some nice length hitting, forcing the boast but he's putting that counter drop in. So now look at the score over here. So they that was actually game point, I believe. So if you come back, it's 11-10, it's game point for Asal. Abulgar actually hits a really good length, forcing the boast from Asal. He hits the boast, and then Abulgar tries to go and hit the perfect drop shot, and he catches the tin, actually the bottom, the kind of mid tin, not even the top. And he was trying to just be too fine with that winner, and that's what forced the error. Before I go on, that is a common thing because when you know your opponent moves so well into the front of the court, there's so much pressure on you. And then at that position being game ball down, there's so much pressure where in his mind, he's probably thinking, this needs to be perfect because I need to win this point to come back to level it out at 11-11. That's when the errors creep in. When we shift our mindset from the process focus, which is just do what I got to do, to an outcome focus thinking, which is I have to win this point I or else I'm going to lose the game. Well, all of a sudden you forget your, fo your process and you lose that state of flow, which actually leads to more errors. So let's keep going over here. So nice little change of angle from Abulgar again and then follows it up with a tight drop. And that was nice because see, Abulgar is playing with lots of angles. So if we come back, he plays the cross and then he puts it in straight. And then because he's constantly changing sides, Asal leans to the left and guesses. Abulgar plays a smart shot down the straight wall. Nice change of pace over here. Oh, that's a tight counter. Abulgar took the wrong line to the ball there. Ooh, forcing it. So now we're tied 1-1. Asal sort of gave up in that game because Abulgar took a big lead and Asal didn't want to fight to come back in that game. So now we're into the third game. You see the player is jockeying for position. Abulgar's length is just a little bit too loose. So here's another tip and I've experienced this firsthand. If your length is a little bit loose and you're playing a bigger guy, who likes to take up space on the tee, who likes to hit and come back to the tee, you have to be so accurate with your length. Otherwise, you're almost giving them the opportunity to take a ton of space, volley, and you have to work around them, which is a lot harder. And then you're gonna be getting collisions and you're not gonna get the let if they hit a decent enough ball. So a real, real reminder over here to hit clean length through the court. I think the referee was saying something to us all over here around possibly getting coached from someone in the crowd and how the referee was going to penalize us all for getting coached from the crowd. That's that's what they included there. I don't think he ever got penalized for anything though. It's nice width pushing us all to the back, forcing the boast and beautiful hold. So here's another one-two punch combo. Here's how you set up that one-two punch with a good length. So check out that cross. Ball hits sidewall behind the back of the service box. Asal cannot volley it. So anytime you're playing someone who loves to volley, hit wide cross courts because they're gonna reach for it. They're not gonna be able to get it. They're gonna have to shift back if they're good enough and have that skill and awareness. If they don't have that skill and awareness, they're probably just going to reach for it and entirely miss the ball and you'll probably win the rally right away. So now Asal pushes back. It's a nice tight ball. He's forced to hit a bit of a defensive boast. Abulgar, if you remember from a couple of clips ago, played several tight straight drops. So Asal has to cover that straight drop, but Abulgar adds an amazing hold over here. 
shows him the straight drop, you see Asal's movement starts into the front right, and then the ball is moving away from him. That, that was a wicked, wicked hold. Set up, show straight, and then punch. And you see it here, and then punch. See, it's not, it's not a flick with the wrist. Something is a coaching tip. He didn't do this. He came and he snapped his forearm across. He didn't flick his wrist. A lot of people try to flick a lot, and you don't get power out of that. And the ball usually will fluff up. Okay. Some change of pace to defend from Abelgar to get to the tee. That's loose. Fishing for the stroke. I'm not a fan of that. I believe he got a stroke over there. He had a lot of space. Could have probably hit that. Because he waited and let that ball come. Again, jockeying for position with the length. Foundation of squash. Abulgar is hitting... So now there's an example. So a couple of things to talk about here. So if you look, Abulgar is hitting the short. He's trying to hit kills. Other than that, and here. He tries to hit the kill, but you see his ball not only popped out, but the first bounce was around here. The second bounce is in the service box. That's kind of what, what I've typically called no man's land. If you're hitting your ball that's going to take a second bounce in the service box, you're leaving your opponent no choice but to hit it in the service box. They can take up as much space as they want in the middle of the court and you are stranded because you're stuck behind them or beside them and they can literally hit anywhere, especially if the ball's off the sidewall. So you see Asal over here hits, moves back right into Abulgar's line and he didn't hit the tightest shot and because he's moving right back into the line, Abulgar got the stroke in that situation. And then the part I don't understand is he's celebrating before anything's happened. I, I don't quite follow that. I think it's maybe uh, a ploy, a mind game to try to convince the referee that it's uh, that he hit a winning shot. I'm not sure. Probably from his junior days. Some uh, some junior antics. But it's good to see the stroke being awarded against him because that's what's going to teach him not to make those sorts of movements and actually give the opponent space to go get the ball. See more jockeying for position. Abulgar is hitting the tight balls, forcing Assault to defend. He's playing a ton down that left side. And there's the combo. Assault counters it. This is a, this is a great rally. They're both battling each other with attacking and defending. This is great length that's setting these options up. Nice tight balls, and that's glued. So here's an example. You don't need to do anything fancy. You just see he just gently kind of poked, pushed that ball into the front court. It bounces, and it's just glued to that side wall. And you can't do anything from that position. Check it out from here. There's the little poke push. Glue it to the side wall. Even the best players in the world struggle to pick that ball up. Nice, Nick. And that was huge. 13-12. He finished. He, he went up 2-1 with that cross court, Nick, which is, that's huge. So he's on a high, as you can see. Again, it started with good length. Forced the loose ball. So this is that length. Forced the loose ball. Goes for the cross court, Nick. Now we're into the fourth, and if I remember correctly, Abulgar just steamrolled through this game. Nice drops, changing direction, hitting the nick on the cross. He's just hitting his targets and playing the high percentage squash by sticking that ball to the side wall. And then by the end of it, you'll notice Asal just sort of gave up. Trying to be a bit too fancy with that drop. Hits it into the tin. And here we are at game ball, just a little change of direction. Asal's not interested. He's saving himself for the fifth game. And this was interesting where after a two minute or after the 90 seconds uh, between games, Asal says that he has an injury. So he gets another self-inflicted injury timeout for, I think it's three minutes. So he basically, he, he looked pretty gassed as well. And I think he wanted to kind of break the momentum. So he took this time to gather himself, break the momentum, and move forward. So Abulgar in this game actually went up 6-2. Oh, that was wicked. 
Abulgar attacked, Asal totally changed the pattern of play. It looked from that position under pressure. This is what I talked about in the beginning of the video. You don't think he has many options. The only option he has is straight and he goes and flicks it cross. So Abulgar had a big lead and then Asal actually worked really hard and caught up to him. So this is some hard work over here. And look at that defending, that lob. So this is where defense can actually be turned into offense. So check this out. Both these players are doing a fantastic job with attacking and counter-attacking. So Asal is attacking here. Abulgar actually plays a pretty high boast. Asal plays the cross-court flick, which in this case probably isn't the best shot because he's not quite aware of Abulgar's position. He's super central on the tee, and this ball is coming right onto his racket. Something on the left-hand side wall would have probably been better, but I mean, it's so easy to say when you're off the court watching, right? Abulgar gets on that ball nice and early, puts in that nice drop. Asal gets a wicked, that, that's a tough ball to pick up. He gets it nice and early. So now Abulgar could, and a lot of players would come and either counter drop it or crush the ball. But unless he hits that cross court really wide, Asal is probably going to volley it because he's going to be looking for the volley. If he wanted to come and play the quick counter drop, Asal is so close to the front wall that he would get on that ball quite early. If he tries to go straight, Asal can stick his racket out, and unless it's glued, it's a stroke. So what does he do? He goes in and plays a beautiful lob. And that lob, look at that, just catches the side wall and dies. You don't see lob winners that often in the top levels. And see, you can hit a winner soft, hard, doesn't matter. A winner is a winner. Abulgar is attacking again, making Asal work and forces at 10-9 Asal had match ball and he crushes a cross court into the tin because he's trying to hit that winner and then here 11-10 match ball for Asal Abulgar hits that loose length oh and that's nasty so see this is what I was saying earlier you hit a loose length you give your opponent the opportunity to take up a ton of space and that's exactly what Asal does over here it goes to the video referee's decision so see, his length is literally in the service box. He has to give him space. Asal crushes the ball. And then look at this. Look at that knee go forward as he's hitting the ball. And then the back leg comes in. Abulgar trips on him. And he goes down. And Asal's already celebrating over here, which truthfully to me is very annoying. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And he's into it. He's hyped up. He's got his adrenaline. And the ref gives a no let, unfortunately which is, uh, in my opinion, quite unfortunate. So there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that review. This is a nice long video. Lots of coaching tips for you guys with different scenarios, different angles, different positions. I cannot possibly summarize it all because there is so much. I would highly encourage you to watch the whole video if you have time. And as always, like the video if you did like it leave a comment letting me know what you thought of it what you enjoyed what you took from it because if you leave a comment sharing what you learned it's just going to cement the learning from the video and then go and practice some of this stuff go and practice changing your patterns using different height and pace and angles and all of that good stuff that we talked about that you saw the players demonstrate as always thank you for your support and i will see you in the next video